back into our understanding of the market model, into our near potting, right, with the code that we were using the other day, NIUPF. N I U E F. N I U N I U P F is the code to jump in to our hair pod. We're almost there now. Most of the time. Again. All right, now, we are, as said, taking this as slow as we can, slow and steady, okay? But there will be opportunities for this to increase by, well, increase in, comple in complexity. And when the increases come, it will be quite quick, All right? So please do not be worried about needing to ask questions. Um, you can always, Send them also by email. Um, that's another way to ask questions. Rather technologically handy. All right. So we last left our intrepid explorers. We were discussing the ideas that you could have a market, yes, and our market could be broken up here, and we could look at the different structures within it. So we could talk about the businesses and whether they had a level of market power. The idea being that the more power they have, the more control over the market they have. However, the less power they have, the more competitive they are. Now, competition is one of your major things. Okay? It doesn't necessarily mean that we are wanting to get all the way down to here because power sounds really good, right? Most people in America at the moment seem to want power. One in particular comes to mind. Um, if we move back this way, from an economics perspective, we tend to suggest that the best, the best model for our economy is actually this one. Perfect competition. But in order to get there, we're actually going to have to meet a whole lot of different criteria. We're going to have to see where the market has lots of businesses. We're going to have to talk about whether there is market power within it. We're going to have to figure out if there is differentiation happening with the different products. And we're also going to have to figure out whether it's easy to do business. Right? There, and if it is good and easy to do business, how easy is it to stop doing business? Now, I'm going to tell you a wee secret. Not a big secret. Surprise. All right? It's this one. In your IB, one of the requirements for you all doing the diploma is something called an EE. -E. Right? E! Okay. Now, at some point, I'm guessing someone's going to have a chat to you about that. I don't know when that is. I'm sure that will happen at some point. And you will need to be thinking about which subject you wish to do an EE in. I'm going to tell you in advance that a lot of kids pick English. A lot of the kids pick the sciences. Okay? A lot of kids pick the humanities. Okay? Now, last year, I had one EE. Woohoo! <laughs> I felt good about that. All right? My first year here, seven economics EEs, all right? Now, because last year I had one EE and that particular learner didn't complete the EE, okay? They, they're not doing the diploma anymore. So I didn't have any, I don't have any. Fantastic, good for me. However, law of large numbers suggests that because there are 18 of you, there's a strong chance that at least one of you will pick economics for your EE. The reason why I'm bringing that up now is because market power 
and market structure for economics tends to be one of the leading examples of EEs in economics that we can do because it's relatively straightforward to do. The next one that would be relatively straightforward to do, and I say straightforward because, um, you know, you talk about micro and macroeconomics. So trying to do a macroeconomic EE is like PhD level. Okay, it's going to be really hard. Hello. So microeconomics, much, much more straightforward. Now we have got the new topic of behavioral economics. So that might be possible too. Okay, to have an EE along some line within behavioral economics. The reason why I'm saying it now is because this is the, as we're in this topic now, right, so you are starting to see the words, the terminologies, etc. If this is, because the EE, the, one of the tricks to the EE is that you're going to be doing it over X number of months. I can't remember how many months, okay, but a number. Ten, maybe. So if it's going to, if you're going to pick a topic that you're going to get bored with, okay, <laughs> after a month, okay, then yeah, that might be a problem, okay? So you want to have a knowledge about the sorts of EEs that are possible from the different subjects that you take. That way, and you can even ask your teachers, that way you've got an understanding and you can go into whatever discussions there are about EEs and Miss Bridget, right, EE boss, okay? Um, you can have discussions with her about that, but you do have to bear in mind that, now this is also a tricky one, if you're picking a particular subject for your EE, you won't necessarily get the teacher of that subject as your supervisor. Is that, yeah? So yes, there were seven economics EEs, but I was not responsible as the supervisor for seven. I was responsible for two, right? And I was somehow responsible for a business management one. Go figure, okay? Which meant that there was the, I don't know, one of the other teachers, a maths teacher was doing one and somebody else was doing one and somebody else was doing one. Um, and Miss Morag took one, which was very helpful, right? Because uh, she took coups, if you remember coups. Uh, she took his EE as a supervisor. Very helpful, I must say. All right? Um, so understand that, because let's say, let's uh, imagine that you did decide, oh, economics, yeah, yeah, I, I'm going to, yeah. It won't guarantee that I would be your supervisor. Because you're all thinking, yes, because then Mr. David would be my supervisor, and that'd be awesome. No. <laughs> all right? Won't guarantee that at all. Okay? It might be that you want to do sports science. It might be that you want to do maths and do statistical analysis. Uh, didn't Park do, did he do a, um, uh, was it his maths IA or his EE um, that was about basketball? Anyway, one of those, right? Now, again, there will be examples you can see, and Miss Bridget has all of that, and it is a wee way off yet before she will start talking to you, but because you are forward-thinking rock stars, good idea to start thinking about the different subjects that you have, what possible topics could there be. Okay? And if you're interested about economics, you can always talk to me. Now, if we look at that extreme end, that's the one that we had down here. The idea of perfect competition. What would that look like? Yeah? You think? Apple and Samsung? Maybe. Maybe. Well, there's a bit of a clue in the, in the titles. Is this one. So they're going to have to be competitive. So which means, because you saw the spectrum, yeah? So what that suggests is that these are going to be businesses without market power. Right? So when you say about Apple and Samsung, we're probably going to say maybe not, okay? Because they've got a lot of market power. Yeah? 
Then, there's that word there. Right? Which I know you look into your better half's eyes and that is the word that you come up with. <laughs> oh dear. All right. All right. Okay. So, because it's an, I've used the word extreme somewhere here. Extreme. Extreme. All right. Um, for a reason. In case you're not familiar with this particular word, it is a pretty serious word. Yeah? Because I know, as I joked, you might think that you know somebody who's perfect. All right? But, yeah? And you don't all have to shout my name at once. Okay, just saying. Just saying. All right? How many things in life are perfect? Nothing. Sorry. All right. So you get what I'm getting at. Now, this is a, a good TOK-ish moment. This is a good understanding of the critical aspects that you can get with regards to economics that in real life, how on earth are you going to find something that is perfectly competitive? It's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to do. Now, the example we've given here is like the, the sort of the market stall sort of approach, where there's no market power. They just popped up a stall and they're selling a product. And it might be that everybody else is selling the same thing. Therefore, they're competing with everybody. Yeah? It'll be kind of the equivalent of Anybody played a game in, in, in what's your favorite subject? PE? I say favorite subject, second favorite subject, obviously economics. Right? There's a, a game that they used to play a lot in New Zealand called Dodgeball. All right. Now I know you, you've played it. Yeah? I say you've played it, you probably think you've played it. Okay. Imagine playing dodgeball with rugby players from New Zealand. Yeah? Okay, just, just picture that in your head, okay? <laughs> All right, boys and girls who can throw a dodgeball really hard, okay? Imagine now that the dodgeball teams aren't teams, they're all individual. It's everybody against everybody else. That would be fairly competitive. All right? Just, all right, where on earth would they, the ball be coming from, all right? Perfectly competitive. You are competing against everybody in that case. Is there any in real life? Well, maybe not. But what we've said is that this is something that economists like because it's our theme. Competition. So what we're going to discover is that we want this. So we're going to be petitioning the government, trying to encourage them to move businesses this way. We want less market power, more competition. That's what economists are going to want. That's why we, you read, if you, if you read the, the sort of history of, of businesses around the world, that's why some of the businesses that you know of today actually still exist. Right? Uh, classic example, have you heard of this company? I'm going to write it here. A, T, and T. What does it stand for? Telecom, mm. telecom, yes. Yes. American Telephone and Telegraph. Oh. Right. Where did it come from? Yeah. Well done. Yes. All right. Would it surprise you to know that one of the people who started this particular company, not in its current form, was a gentleman known as Alexander Graham Bell? Who's he? The guy who invented the phone. Yeah. Now, he invented a, a telephone company called Bell Telephone Company. He was the only one with the telephone. There was no one else. He had the market power. Now, we in economics said, no, 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 that doesn't sound good. But the Americans get a bit twitchy around market power, as you probably have seen. 
So they actually attacked his business, not literally, legally through the courts, and they smashed it. Right? So you end up with companies called things like Northern Bell, Southern Bell, Eastern Bell, Bell Pacific, and then you ended up with AT&T. Over time, interestingly enough, a lot of those companies have started slowly getting back together again. All right? And that's why AT&T is actually quite a big company now. All right? Because it has been gathering market power. You might not be aware that there was another company that owned pretty much all of the railroads in America. Almost all of them. Run by one family. Quite a wealthy family. Yeah. Okay, there's a, a really interesting documentary. Uh, now, if you watch it, there is a particular cameo that might make you feel a bit unwell by a particular gentleman who, whose name starts with Donald. Okay? Uh, he appears in it. This particular, because he was in everything. All right? If it's going to pay him money, then he can get money. All right? This particular documentary is called The Men Who Built America. Right, and it talks about these amazing people and what they did and what they achieved, but almost every single time they built these enormous businesses and they all got smashed. Right? Because they gained too much market power, they weren't competitive. So hmm? market power was is this idea here. Right? So this I've used this as a spectrum of competition. But equally, it could be a spectrum of market power. So that would be the most powerful. Oh, and that would be the least. Why? All right, it's about control over a market. Yeah, an entire market. So if your business is the only one controlling the entire market, you are the market. Right? So a long time ago, there was a company that was investing in a very small product called oil. Right? And desperately trying to remember the name of the guy. <laughs> ah, here we go. Got it. Uh, his name was John D. Rockefeller. He almost went bankrupt many, many times. Many times. Um, and he was on his way to meet another very famous business person about oil, and he decided he missed the train. Okay? He, he didn't make it on the train. And the train crashed, and everybody on the train died. And then he made a later train to go and see this businessman. But it was at that point that he had an epiphany, a, a, a mental revelation, and it was he didn't die on the train. So therefore, God had chosen him. It does sound rather Trumpy, all right? God had chosen him to do the best he possibly could be. He is going to be amazing. He was going to be great. Yeah. And anybody who disagreed with him, hello. Anybody who disagreed with him was wrong. Really does sound familiar, doesn't it? Now, John D. Rockefeller was not necessarily the nicest of people. And he was in oil. And one of the things that he did was say, well, I want more of this power stuff. So he went around buying other oil companies, a whole lot. I'll buy your company, I'll buy your company, I'll buy your company, I'll buy your, right? He bought them all. And then what he did is he created a brand for the oil that that company did. Hello! Sorry, my goodness. He's alive. <laughs> We've got an Andrew. <laughs> You okay? Yeah. Uh, what's that? I sent it You allowed to be here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Just, you know, shallow grids. Um, <laughs> the, so he created a brand and the brand, the became the company name and it was called Standard Oil, right? And it was became the biggest oil company that there was. He controlled it. 
Now their family grew and grew and the wealth that they had grew and grew. And he became so wealthy and so powerful that people started to get a bit cross with him because of all this market power. So the government came after him and they smashed up his business. Right? They created a law that said anti-competitive, bad. Competitive, sorry. Competitive, good. Anti-competitive, bad. In America, it has the fancy name. It's called the Antitrust Act. Or the Sherman Act. Either way, you don't need to know. But essentially, they took them to court and they said, how did you do this? What about this? How about this? Is that not anti-competitive? And he looked at them in a very Trumpian way and said, that's the way we did business. Yeah? Um, but he was quite tall and he was quite imposing. And yeah, he, he was basically the Donald Trump of his era, in a way. All right? His family was, they, they didn't really like his family after that, pretty much. So his family decided that one of the things that they would do would be to build a giant stadium, name it after themselves, and that way people they could have like cultural things happening there, and people would then like them. The Rockefeller Center. Oh. Yeah. There are still Rockefellers alive in America at the moment. Right? They are still members of that family. Okay. So if you are in America, you know, you just, sometimes there are people that you just need to make sure you're nice to. Okay. They smashed all of his businesses, but one of the clever things that he did was to maintain share ownership in all of the businesses that were created. So he ended up making more money when they smashed up his business than when it was one single business. All right? It's, it is an interesting documentary, but as I say, the cameo from a certain Donald who appears every now and then <laughs> does make you feel a little queasy. Okay? It does. More than a little. Right. So market power is about market control. It's about which company is the biggest, the most powerful within the industry. And if you look back, you look at the Microsofts of the world. You look at the Amazons. You look at the, all of those enormous American businesses. And a lot of them have actually engaged in what is called anti-competitive practices. Now, you might not think it because you look at William H. Gates III, commonly known as Bill, all right, and he looks like the sweetest, gentlest man that there is. But when he was running his business, let me tell you, he was not necessarily a nice man. Yeah, it's missing. Okay. Yeah, there there are a whole range of other Rockefeller and Rockefeller people. Uh, there there are yeah a range of them. All right. Uh, there's also the Rothschild family. There's uh, there's the, uh, the the Fords. Yes. No, they're still there. There's still some Rothschilds there in America. Another incredibly old and incredibly wealthy family, the Rothschilds. All right. Again, if you watch that documentary, it kind of all fits into place, all of these families, and a lot of them interacted with each other. Yeah. Uh, J.P. Morgan, who you probably don't know, but you will know because his name gets mentioned almost every single time they talk about economic statistics. All right. Um, there is a bank in his name, right. and J.P. Morgan at one point became the wealthiest man in the world. Right. Now, obviously, Jeff Bezos is taken that particular crown, and he will likely stay that way, I assume. There won't be anybody who will beat him. Right, so that's what we're after. This idea about market power control in economics, we're not particularly keen on it because it is considered anti-competitive, whereas in economics, we want things to be competitive. We're looking for this as our ideal. All right, so we want to try and push businesses this way. So if we think a business is getting too big and too powerful, then we want the government to smash it. Oh, but Microsoft never got smashed. Yes, it did. All right, it absolutely did. Apple never got smashed. Yes, they did. And they continue to, all right? And there are court cases about Amazon, and there are court cases even ongoing today about Apple, right? lots of them, in different parts of the world. 
All right. The opposite end that we saw, this way around, the most imperfect. All right, so you had perfect competition. Then as soon as you step away from something that's perfect, everything else is imperfect. Does that make sense? And the further you go down the level of imperfection, you end up with the most imperfect, which is the idea of a monopoly, which was my joke the other day about the one parrot. Okay. And a monopoly, which is, yes, one of the world's most popular board games, is all about, I mean, you look at it, it's all about trading property in order to become the king of property and wipe everybody else out, make them all bankrupt. That's essentially the name of the game. It's all about market power. Now, there are some other words there. One of the next one is a little bit scary. It's called an oligopoly. Oligopoly. All right, it's called an oligopoly. And there's a really cool video that I will show you at some point about oligopolies. Maybe today if we have time. Okay, it's very short. It's very funny. I like it. South Koreans in the room? They may not like it. We'll see. We will see. All right, an oligopolist is close to a monopoly, but it's not. An oligopolist, there are a few very large firms. So when you mention the Apples and the Samsungs, and you might want to add the wow, 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 right, in there as well, potentially. And there's a company called Red that sells phones as well. Hmm. Red. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. So there are a few, and they're large. So they have a lot of market power, but there's more than one of them. Right? And Adam Smith had something very important to say about that. And he said that when they get together, these businesses, if they're few and large, they get together, they're going to have conversations that you and I are going to like. To such an extent that if you work these days for some businesses that are very big, it is writ sometimes written into your job contract that you are not allowed to socialize with people from the other businesses. All right? Otherwise, it's possible that secrets might be passed, maybe, or that it might look like you're working together. Yeah, now I don't know, but you know, you, you you rock on up to the hub, and you see a couple of the other year twelves that you know sitting in a corner having a conversation, and then you walk over to them, and all of a sudden, something's going off. Yes, yes. So the the Sherman Act or the Antitrust Act is the name of the law in America with regards to competition. All right, so when two or three businesses are gathered together to have a conversation, it is generally assumed by Adam Smith that their conversation is basically going to be about us, right? Their conversation is going to be about, you know, artificially raising prices, right? How about we do this? Shh, don't tell anybody, but we're going to raise the prices. They're going to have to pay. Woo, think of the money. Think of the money. All right. I'm still on an oligopoly at the moment. All right. Now, there are probably more oligopolies in the world than there are in almost any other business. Okay. Just about. And as I said, um, Andrew missed this bit, okay? If you were thinking about 
EEs, e right? Um, one of the, again, topics that quite often in the past, particularly with the old syllabus, okay, that learners will have done would be working out the market structure of a particular market and trying to say, is it perfectly competitive? No, okay, is it an oligopoly? Oh, okay, yeah, trying to work out where it fits. And then what evidence do you have and all of those sorts of things. And that's quite a straightforward essay for them to do. It becomes a lot more complicated sometimes. Okay, but that is quite a straightforward essay to do. Now, the next one down, right, that Joel number one pointed out. The Joel. Captain Joel. That's Lieutenant Joel. Yeah. All right. The one that's mentioned here is a monopolistic competitor. Monopolistic competitor. Now I'm going to take you for, for a metaphorical journey. Imagine yourself going into a mall. Whichever mall takes you fancy. M-A-L-L mall, just in case I'm saying that with a Kiwi accent and you didn't understand me. All right? Right. Well, I said well, I had the year 10s, and I talked to them about air. What? Stuff that you breathe. And they said, air, air, <laughs> air. We breathe air. Then how do you say H-E-I-R? Hmm? Then how do you say H-E-I-R? How do I say? H-E-I-R. Here. And then yes, here. And then yes, here. Yes. Which is why my, my wife teaches my son how to speak, not me. <laughs> right? Which is why his accent can be quite interesting at times. Okay? New Zealand, UK, American from the YouTube. Right? Oh, honestly, please, now. There's one guy on the channel that he watches who plays these video games, and then he uses the Americanism, dang. Have I said that already? Oh, it's an awful phrase. Hideous phrase. And so Harley John will use it. Oh, dang it! Every time he says that, I channel my father, and it's not a nice thing to do. All right? And our family language was like, Woo! okay? You definitely did not swear, okay? And you were not allowed words that were even remotely close to swearing. So I was not allowed to use the word stuff, all right? Particularly when I told my sister to stuff off, all right? No, not allowed, naughty, yeah? Okay. So we had lots of conversations in our household about the appropriate use of words, and, and I can tell you right now, I would have gotten into so much trouble if I'd have said Danny. Oh, boy, yeah? So I did. I got away with Gordon, and you might have heard me say that from time to time, uh, Gordon or Gordon Bennett, um, because that's a very old, ancient English way of basically swearing. Okay. Um, so uh, yes, I do use that from time to time. A monopolistic competitor. You're in the mall. 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 Where the shops are. And you decide, you decide, right, that you're going to go and get a hair, hair, hair cut. Yeah? I didn't want to want to look at when how. All right? Okay. Yeah, done. I will set you right one day, mate. I'll tell you that right now. Now, a hair cut, right? So you're going along and you're finding these places, hair dresses, which doesn't mean that they put the clothes on your head. Hair. 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 <laughs> a hair, hair dresser. Right. Now, 
right? What you're likely to find is that there are a few of them. Okay, probably quite a number. This floor, this floor, this floor, this floor, this floor. Yeah? And they all offer kind of different ideas. Yeah? Some of them are unusual. All right? But they all offer. There's one, and we used to go to it, and it used to whack you on the back. <laughs> what are you doing? First time they did that, I was like, on earth? He's just cut my hair and he's whacking me on the back. What's going on? All right? Um, that was in this, this one. Alamandamal? Alamanda. No, no, I'm saying the name Alamanda. Alamanda. That more. Right? Because it was cheap. It was like 10 ringgit. <laughs> Done. Fantastic. Yeah? Um, whacking you on the back. What's that do? Right. Um, yes. Now, it might be that you go to the hairdresser. Yes. And then you go to, I don't know, the, the nearest 7-Eleven, we have those, yes, to get yourself a drink, a dairy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right? And you go there and you think, oh, there's just 7-Elevens everywhere. Every corner. Woo. Anybody been to San Francisco? Yeah? There's a law in San Francisco about how many Starbucks they're allowed. You know that one? Yeah. Because, and there's, um, what's the other one? Uh, is it Walgreens? Yeah. Walgreens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause, Cause you, you go like, there's a Starbucks. There's a Starbucks. There's, like down one street, it's like Starbucks, Walgreens, Starbucks, Walgreens, Starbucks. So it was so prevalent that the, the governing body of San Francisco had to say, look, stop. Okay. <laughs> Just, that's enough. We will have this many and no more, okay? Because it was quite literally one on every corner. So there was a lot of them, potentially very competitive, but you don't go to every one. Just like you don't go to every hair dresser, you go to the one that you know. Right? Maybe the one that knows you, and you turn up, and then, hey, how you going? You want your usual cut? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Done. Yeah? So therefore, it's kind of a monopoly. There are lots of them, but you only go to one. Because it's your local. It's your favorite. You go there because they know you. Right? There's a restaurant that we go to, but, but, and they know us so well that we turn up. Do oh, you want your usual? Yes, please. To go. Yes, please. Particularly at the moment, it's all to go. Right? Yeah. You just go back because they know you. Lots of other restaurants. Lots of other hairdressers all do the same thing. But you will go to one. Specifically, that one. Alright? My wife goes to one hairdresser. That's it. Nowhere else. It's not that the others don't do a good job. I don't know. It's that's the one she trusts and knows. And has always gone to. Uh, to the extent that when we have thrown, flown through Malaysia, we have stopped and she's gone to them. Wow. All right. Living in China, <laughs> holiday to Malaysia, go and see the hairdresser. Uh -huh. yeah. Living in Thailand, holiday in Malaysia, go and see the hairdresser. Do, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Sorry? We, well, we used to, my wife used to live here uh, before the school was built. Uh, my wife taught at a school you might have heard of called Garden, Garden School. Apparently there's a garden there. I went there, I never saw one, right? Um, now, so yeah, so she taught there for a while uh, and then she moved from there to New Zealand, okay, quite rather handily for me. Okay, um, and 
from then on out, we would come back to Malaysia. Holidays. Let's go to Malaysia. All right, so when we did make trips, say, to the UK, Malaysia first, UK. All right, go to New Zealand. We're in New Zealand. Living in China, Malaysia, New Zealand, New Zealand, Malaysia, China. Thailand, Malaysia, Malaysia, New Zealand, New Zealand, Malaysia, Malaysia, Thailand. So we wanted to live here. So we came here and went here. Yeah. <laughs> from New Zealand. Uh, yeah. Um, this was all pretty amazing. All right. Come and see. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, we had two, I think, two honeymoons here. Two. Sorry? No. Never been there. Uh, we have talked about it. We've almost gone there. We've almost gone to the Cameron Highlands a couple of times. We went to Port Dixon a few times. Uh, there's a, a resort there. Um, begins with the letter A. Something like that. And you sit out on the water. That's quite nice. Yeah, so, and as we did honeymoon Australia here, Hawaii, here, UK, here. No, 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 no. Oh my God. Yeah, more than one, dude. They're good. Yeah. Yes. One, one of those yeah, and it might be that it's the local one. It's the one that's right next door to your house. So the nearest 7-Eleven to your house that you always go to to get your Red Bull, right? It might be that it's the hairdresser that knows you and knows your hair and knows the styles you like or, or whatever. It might be the restaurant that knows your, your food preferences and, and, yeah, and you're comfortable there, yeah? Whatever it is, there's a lot of them, but you tend to go to one. Right? So they're considered to be a monopolistic competitor. It's not perfect, but it's close. Yes. If there are, are the same area, we have like family one, family one is seven eleven, and then the other convenience stores, right? We're not going to go to one ten minutes away where you can go to one night. Otherwise known as the Starbucks principle. It's not like it's not an actual monopoly, but it's just like something that you personally would go to, but not others. Yes. Uh, you go to it and you go to it all the time, so therefore it is essentially a local monopoly for you. Right? Now there is another type of market structure that kind of exists outside of the structure that we saw and it's got an even more exciting name than all of the other names you don't technically need to know it by the way um, but it's called the monopsony which is cool all right and yes when i was at school learning about a monopsony i couldn't pronounce it correctly so i kept calling it monopopsony right until big sister corrected me and said no it's monopsony Right, a monopsony is a monopoly, but it's a monopoly on labor in particular. All right, so it is the kind of the reverse end. So it's not the producer and the products that's the monopoly, it's the labor. So they're either all buying their labor resource from one place, right, or the labor themselves have so much power that you come to us. Yeah. So typically it's very unionized. No, no, labor. In this, in this, well, in that example, I was referring to labor. Yeah. 
So, for example, if, if there's a business where uh, anybody know people who are in the medical profession? Yeah. So if, if somebody is a medical doctor, in order to become a medical doctor, you need a license to practice, I would assume. Not everywhere, I guess, but most places you will. Now, therefore, when the hospital is trying to employ doctors, they've got one organization that they deal with. Right? They're not going just randomly down the street going, you a doctor, you a doctor, you... No. They go to the one governing body that controls medical doctors, and from that group, they're going to pick their doctors. Yeah? So any business that certifies the labor tends to be a monopsony. So, for example, teachers who get registered, like myself, for example, in New Zealand, there is a teacher registration board. And you register to become a teacher. And you have to meet all these criteria, etc. Yeah? And as a result of that, you become a, an official teacher. Therefore, the schools, the only people that they technically hire are registered teachers. Doesn't stop them from hiring unregistered teachers, and nine times out of ten, that ends in disaster. Okay? But sometimes they do, because unregistered teachers are cheaper. Okay? Uh, or it could be other resources, very well thought of, Lieutenant Gold. Okay? Um, and we would be thinking of other types of resources. So a classic example in New Zealand is this one. Okay. Which in New Zealand would be pronounced monk. I'm led to believe that non-New Zealanders pronounce that particular product milk. Milk. New Zealanders tend to substitute the I for a U. Mock. I'm going down to the dairy to get some mock. <laughs> then I might go to the butchers to say a phone. Milk. M U L K. Right? So this is M I L K milk. Right? Now, in New Zealand, as you understand, there are a whole lot of cows as well as sheep. Yeah. All right. And if the cows are in the middle of the road, the one thing you want is for them to move. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. That's, that's one my son likes. There you go. All right. Now. So New Zealand makes a lot of this. And there are a lot of farmers who make this. However, in New Zealand, believe it or not, there is essentially more or less one company that takes all of the milk. Because New Zealand's at the bottom end of the world, and we're competing with all of these countries all around the world, and they're big and scary. And some of them have Donald's in them, which is woo -hoo. All right, if you're going to have a Donald's, make it a McDonald's. Yeah, right now. All right. All right now. So we have basically perfect competition amongst individual milk producers, but when New Zealand exports its milk, it exports it from one com one company. Yeah. And that one company you've possibly even heard of, it's called Fonterra. Okay? It is, I think, about the third or fourth largest dairy industry, dairy business in the world. All right? Somewhere around there. All right? Nestle is above it, but the gap between the two is, is quite large. Okay? Uh, by, by mile. So, uh, yeah, so uh, that, that company... Uh, the company basically provides milk to other companies. Yeah, so it's all around the world. Right, so when there was the issue with the baby milk powder in China and all the babies were dying, it was Fonterra that was in trouble with regards to that. Uh, no, the, the one that I'm thinking of and referring to was the one in China. 
right? Fonterra were outsourcing the packaging of the baby milk powder in China, and the factory that they were using was, um, the machinery wasn't particularly good, and parts of the machinery would break off and splinter uh, and turn into basically plastic shards as it went through the, the milling process for the powdered milk, and then it will end up in the actual container and get sold to families. So essentially what the families had bought was milk powder loaded with plastic. And the babies would drink it and then become quite unwell, and a number of them died. Doesn't it? Because you're not supposed to. You know? Obviously, eat plastic. So, yeah, so Fonterra got into a bit of trouble with regards to that. But they are I, one of the world's largest producers of milk powder in the world. And if you think milk powder isn't an exciting product, you've never tried to buy it in a Chinese supermarket, neither have I. All right, this is where they fight over it. They will even fight over it in Australia, okay, because it is that valuable, because there's so little of it, all right, that Australian supermarkets will actually put milk powder under lock and key. They do it here too, yeah. because people will fight each other for the last remaining containers of milk powder. So that's a monopsony. Right. But you really don't need to know that. Now, what was the monopoly again? Go! Right. Is it Taiwan or Hong Kong? Taiwan. A single buyer of resources. That's either the, the producer is the only one who buys the resources, or the resources themselves are the only supply of that resource. Yes. Yes, it's, it's like one step away. It's like a, a spectrum, and you have perfect competition, which is the ideal at one end, and monopoly at the other, and then you step away from those, and each step, the, the structures progressively change. Yes, oligopoly, and then monopolistic competitor. Oh, sorry, no, you're right. Oligopoly, then monopoly. What's the difference between them? Not a lot. The difference between them will be things like how differentiated their products are. Um, the difference will be is there any, is it free to enter and exit? Um, the, the difference will be uh, how much profit do they make? Yeah. Depending, yeah. They might be an oligopoly. It depends on whether they are uh, a chain, for example. Uh, so if you if you take, because you, restaurants is quite a broad term, right? So if you take a specific type of restaurant, then you might end up with just an oligopoly. Because there'll be a handful of businesses that can do whatever that is. So um, the really popular one that I see queues of people in the malls out of the, the Korean pop, pop things. They're like, they've got like a, a, basically it's like soup. They're like a bowl and they put food in it, it cooks and they eat it. Cheap restaurant, man, come on. 
All right, they, you do all the work, yeah? Uh, but yeah, so you would assume that there aren't many of those. And if there are lots of them, they're probably part of a chain, in which case they're more likely to be an oligon. But if we take restaurants in general as everybody, then yeah, they could be more competitive, perhaps. Interesting. Okay. All right. Good. All right. All right. Now, uh, we've kind of kind of applied this, I think, or I've even suggested it. So the connection between market structure and market power. All right. Okay, the connection between market structure and market power. So the idea is, is that the more competitive the business is, the less power they have. The less competitive they are, the more power they have. And it's quite weird because at the same time that I'm teaching you this, I've got the distance learners here, and they're actually having conversations with each other. And then every now and then I'm going to look to see if I need to answer their question. So it's a bit, yeah? So okay, they're talking amongst themselves. All right. Woohoo, here we go. Now, step number two. Now that we know that a market exists, now that we know that there are structures and powers involved within the market, we need to know what a market's going to actually look like and how it's going to work. So the first step on the ladder with regards to that is this idea of demand, okay, which isn't what mum and dad say to you when it's time to go to bed. That's a different kind of demand. Yeah. When we're talking about demand in an economic sense, we're talking about an individual's willingness and ability to purchase goods and or services. It has two parts. It's known as effective demand. Two parts. Willingness and ability. Willingness is your wants, your desire, your, you want this product. I have seen the Apple Watch Series 6. I want the Apple Watch Series 6. They come in different colors. That's cool. Yeah. I have seen the iPad Magic Stand. I want, I want one. I do. Yeah. All right. Then the next part of it, though, is the ability. You can want things till the cows come home, which in New Zealand wasn't as often as it should be. Yeah? Maybe I need to move on from the joke now. <laughs> yeah? Right. Sometimes I wonder if I'm being heard or whether it's just a herd of cows. <laughs> now. <laughs> All right. Okay. The ability is your income. And this is the bit that, you know, is a bit always, always a bit, is a bit disconcerting sometimes. Because if you've ever been in a shop and you've seen something that you really want, and then you've had a look at your bank balance and gone, ah, um, maybe next month. Yeah, maybe next year. Yeah. And I tell you, I, I've got to say, you guys have it much worse than I did when I was growing up. Because nowadays you buy things just like, click, bought. All right? You can just look at your phone and you've bought something. It's scary. Yeah? 
Whereas in the past, you used to have to go to a shop. You used to have to open your wallet and take actual real money out. These days, you, oh, here's this piece of plastic that somebody is guaranteeing somewhere. Bleep, bleep. Woohoo! I bought it. All right. Average number of credit cards per American? Okay. An individual's willingness and ability. In order for demand to occur at all, you have to have those two things. If there's willingness but no ability, no demand. If there's ability but no willingness, no demand. So you can have the money, but not want the Donald Trump bobblehead. Because there is. Yeah. All right? You can have the money, but not want the life-size cardboard cutout of Donald Trump. Because there is. You can have the money, but not want the children's coloring in book Starring superhero Donald Trump. Yes, way. Not only that, but it's actually being sold through the Republican Party, their websites. It is a fundraiser for Trump and his. Yeah, there it is. Is that battleship? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that we have to wonder, and I do. I honestly do. I wonder why. I have a look at some of the stuff people. I mean, I don't understand the mega t mega hats. Okay, I don't understand that. Yeah, but I do wonder why people buy some of the things that they buy. I do, and you might as well. Now, when we tabulate demand, a surprising thing comes up. If you put demand into a table, not the one that you're sitting at, different kind, right? There's a rule with regards to the table. And the rule goes, price on the left, quantity on the right. Price, quantity, always. It's the rule, or if you like, the convention, which is a different kind of convention to when you dress up and run, run around. That's a whole different kind of convention. Live long and prosper. Right. Now, next part of this. We might tread on some toes. Let's see how we get on. All right. This here is actually has a name. It's called a demand schedule. Yeah. Now, it could be you are perfectly entitled to call it a demand schedule. That all depends on whether you went to school or shul. By the way, in case you're wondering, both are right. Yes. Only if you spell it like this. That's sure. Which means school. All right, same word. Now, where was I? Yes. You have a demand schedule, a table that you have built up, and you are plotting in the table the different prices of a product and the quantities that you are demanding. All right. Now, hopefully, that's not what mum and dad says, or you're very demanding. No. All right. If we look at it, what we're actually seeing is a relationship. Right, which might be what you see when you look across the table. Yeah, 
right? This relationship is between price and quantity demanded. And it exists in a particular way. As we see here, you'll notice that something is happening here. As we move down the table, what's happening to prices? They're increasing. So price here is increasing. On the same, if we look at the other column, quantity demanded here, as price increases, going down the table, what's happening to quantity demanded? Decreases. Here it is. So the relationship that we've got here is that when price increases, quantity demanded decreases. Cool. And again, it's for you. You understand this because this is what we were discussing with regards to your utility functions, your consumption decisions. You are only going to pay for a product to the extent that it satisfies you. All right? So therefore, if your marginal utility is decreasing, classically, all right, then the only way you are going to increase your quantities, consume, purchase, is if the price falls. That will be the only way. Now, looking at that, Price rising, quantity demanding, quantity demanded increasing. What can you tell me about the direction that they move? Yeah, they move in opposite directions. Opposite. Okay, which is different from your South Korean boy bands, which tend to only move in one direction. No? Wrong area of the world. Is that? There's one direction, not South Korean. <laughs> How would I know? Yeah? Boy bands. I'll go for boy bands. It's all right. All right, they move in opposite directions. Now, if we were being all scientific -y about it, then we would say that they move in inverse to each other. There is an inverse relationship. All right? Another way to describe it is that it is a negative relationship, which is what your mother told you not to get into. No? No. Not relationship. All right. <laughs> If she hasn't, it's well past you. <laughs> there was a couple more New Zealand jokes that were just sitting there, ready to go. We will leave them behind. It's <laughs> All right, so different ways to describe it. Why that's important is because, as I've probably explained ad, ad nauseum, Latin, is if you use the language, you are viewed higher than students, learners, who don't use the language. So the more you are able to learn the terminology, know how to include the terminology in your expressions, tick. Brilliant, rock star, let's give them all the points. Okay? So in this context, using words like inverse relationship or negative relationship, that works. Okay? Can I get rid of all of that? Because it's messy. All right. Now, Jim, Jim, Jim. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take all of those points that we saw on the table and we're going to turn it into a giraffe. All right, and look, look at this, look, price on the left, just like the table, quantity on the right, just like the table, 
And then what you do is play a game about Cartesian coordinates, which is about X's and Y's. Okay? You ready? If you have too many X's, you're obviously not very wise. No? You could equally make the joke the other way around, by the way. Yeah, just saying. Yeah? Now, here we go. All right, price and quantity. Now, if you are at all of a math magician, please accept my apologies right now because you might get a bit upset. All right, because in maths, there's this thing about dependent and independent variables. I'm led to believe that. In economics, we get it run the wrong way because we're economists. We're a little crazy. Well, so. All right. Nisa goes, what did I sign up for? <laughs> By the way, Nisa, can I just say, am I allowed to? I think I am. Can I just say that when I mentioned to another staff member that you were in my class, they were intensely jealous. Oh, you've got Nisa in your class. Oh, I am so jealous. I desperately wanted Nisa in my subject. I thought they were sweet. I, I thought that was very sweet. Yeah. Now, <laughs> left, price, right, quantity. Then what you're going to do is you're plotting the points that are appearing on the table, Cartesian, X and Y. Okay, a little bit mathy, but okay. Then you play the favorite economics game of connect the dots. All right. Now it's a negative relationship. It's an inverse relationship. Therefore, this, what we now call curve, all right, is downwards, towards, sloping. Do we see that? Now, quite often I have to explain this to New Zealand students because they get a bit confused. Okay? This number here is zero. All right? So therefore, these numbers are getting bigger. Okay, so if we look at this, as we saw in the table, if you look at the, the table, you could suggest that the price is decreasing there and the quantity is increasing there. So therefore, the demand curve is sloping downwards. Okay, it looks kind of like a slide in a playground. Max remembers fondly. Yeah. All right. Now, I usually get asked a particular question at around about this time. Captain John? How are you? <laughs> A little tired, to be honest, and not looking forward to the eight to nine year ten parents that I have to speak to later on this afternoon. Now, that's all right. It just started. I mean, no, it's... Welcome. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the insanity. Right. So Joel is probably very correctly wanting to know why. Thank you. Why do we call it a curve when it's quite clearly not? Yeah? Oh, good. Language issues, TOKness creeping in. All right. There's a very good reason why. What we are doing is we are approximating reality. We are trying to make it as simple for our analysis as is possible. So therefore, the demand curve here is illustrated as a straight line. The real demand curve, the one that we see in real life, is much more likely to be an actual curve. Not only that, but if you were really thinking, as I know Lieutenant Joel is, okay, you would start to be asking, looking at this and going, well, how do you get part of a gallon? All right? Because the math magicians are all thinking discrete versus continuous data, all right? And they're looking at there being an infinite number of points between here on the curve. Well, how do you get that in real life? Well, you don't. All right? So real life is going to be different. 
if there's one thing you take away from economics, that would be a good thing to take. Yeah. You know? What's the area? Okay. What's the area mean? The area. Yeah. What are we talking about now? The area. Like the area under it. Yeah. You hang up to the here. Don't panic. We will. You. Six, seven steps ahead. All right. What's underneath there is basically an area of efficiency, but we'll get to that. Okay. Now uh, we are going to need to stop because I'm tired. Okay. <laughs> We're going to need to stop. You're going to need to use the red stuff for the desks, the blue stuff for your hands. Please do that. Uh, we need to shoot rather quickly after school because we need to get home for parent interviews, which we're doing over Zoom. Zoom. So we have to zoom home for the Zoom. All right. As we stand the land of my birthday, call it out. Means goodbye for now. See you. Thank you all.